In this video, we're going to go through the lesson on the periodic table. You can see your learning goals over here, uh, describing how the periodic table is organized, uh, describing the various classes of elements on the periodic table, as well as the properties, the families and their properties, uh, and certain patterns and being able to, dis to uh, discover and identify certain patterns within your periodic tables um, using the idea of the periodic law. So we're going to briefly go through the presentation here and then go and fill in some blanks together. Uh, so this is a great video for you to watch. It's just a nice introduction to periodic table. I do recommend that you watch this over here. You can just click on it through the presentation. And it's a nice, interesting overview it's with some great connections. So this over here is the scientist that, um, or one of the scientists that was responsible for uh, coming up with the periodic table. There were a lot of contributing scientists over the years, um, but what was good about uh, Mendel, Dmitry, uh, sorry, Mendeleev, Dmitry Mendeleev, is that um, he was able to um, make predictions using the using the elements and their properties um, that they had discovered at the time. So for example, if they had discovered a whole bunch of elements, but there was a missing spot in the periodic table, Mendeleev could, for example, say, based on the elements surrounding that missing spot, what the element there might look like if they discovered it someday. And his predictions were quite, um, quite accurate. Uh, so there's a great video regarding that um, over here. If you just click on his, on uh, Dmitry Mendeleev's name over here, you can watch that as well. Um, great connections, just amazing to see the power of prediction that the periodic table can make. So Dmitry Mendeleev is known as the father of the periodic table, who organized elements by properties, and he arranged the elements by uh, by their by their mass. Um, today they're arranged by atomic number, but back then they were arranged by their mass. Um, and like I said, he was able to make predictions about unknown elements based on the way he had um, arranged them. So because of the way the elements are arranged, uh, according to their atomic number, uh, there's something that we call the periodic law. The periodic law is the idea that you can have physical and chemical properties of the elements that repeat in a regular periodic um, pattern uh, when you arrange the elements in their atomic number. So there's patterns that repeat based on properties, physical and chemical properties, when you arrange the elements according to their atomic number. So atomic number one, number two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth. Um, and so those are, uh, there's several different patterns that can arise according to the periodic law. And we're only gonna focus on a few in this presentation, but um, in the next few lessons, we're gonna see a few more um, types of uh, patterns that you can see. Uh, but let's go and study the structure of the periodic table first in a bit more detail and see a few basic patterns that you're already kind of aware of. Um, so first of all, in a periodic table, you have groups or families. Those are your columns, the vertical columns going up and down like this. And so you have 18 of them, one, two, all the way up to 18. This is your 18th column over here, or 18th family. And then the group number tells you the number of uh, valence electrons. So for example, in group number one, you have one valence electron, then two. Then you skip three to 12, because they're the transition metals and they're a bit different. And you go to 13. 13, there's three. 14, there's four. 15, there's five valence electrons. 16, there's six valence electrons. 17, there's seven. And 18, there's a full valence shell. That could be eight, for example, neon. Um, or it could be two, because helium has two valence electrons in its last shell, but its last shell is full because that's the first shell, technically speaking. Um, and the other interesting thing about the, the way these elements are arranged in their groups is that elements within a group have similar chemical and physical properties. So the alkali metals have similar chemical and physical properties to each other. For example, lithium, sodium, potassium, so on and so forth are all very reactive with water. They all have one valence electron. Um, the alkaline earth metals share similar properties. Um, the halogen share similar property, similar properties are very reactive non-metals and the noble gases share similar uh, properties. And one of them is the fact that they have a full valence shell, making them very unstable or very, very stable, I should say, or inert. They're not very reactive. So that's one of the first bits of information you need to know about the periodic table and how it's organized. The other aspect of the periodic table is that there are seven periods or seven rows. Horizontal is a row. So this is a row over here. This is a row over here. Over here, over here, over here, over here, and over here. So there's seven rows in the periodic table, and the um, the uh, rows tell you how many shells um, an element has. So for example, in the first row or first period, elements have one shell, second, two shells, third, three shells, four shells, five shells. So the circles that you draw with the Borath for diagram, um, it tells you how many circles there are there that represent shells. Shells can be called energy levels, shells, orbits, various terms to describe essentially the same thing with some minor differences. Uh, and there's also um, 
trends that can be displayed um, both going up and down and uh, left to right. So later on, you're going to see that you can uh, spot trends with the size of an atom as you go across a period or the size of, of an atom as you go down a period. Um, and, or you can look at the reactivity I do across a period for metals and non-metals. So but there's various trends that we're going to spot later on, but one of the first sort of trends or patterns you noticed is period number tells you shell number and um, the group number tells you the uh, number of valence electrons available or that are present. So here we have a periodic table of elements. You can see the group number on top, the period number here. One thing just to make you aware of um, is that it looks like there's nine periods, nine rows because of these two bottom ones here. But in reality, this one belongs in row six and this one over here belongs in row seven. Um, so we just put them at the bottom so our periodic table is not too large, but they belong in row six and seven. Um, and of course, when we look at our periodic table, you can classify elements into three main classes. You have the metals, which are on the left side of the metalloids. The metalloids is another class. And the non-metals, um, which are on the right side of the metalloids. And for our atomic number, it increases from left to right across a period. So this is atomic number one, increases to two, atomic number two. Then atomic number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So atomic number increases from left to right going across a period. So across period, left to right means from starting from lithium, that's the left side, going to beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon, and then it starts again. So this just illustrates the, uh, the trend or pattern I was mentioning earlier. So if you look at the group number, you have one valence electron for all the elements here. If you look at the... Um, Group number, this is group two, you have two valence electrons for all the elements there. Um, and then you can continue. We removed the transition metals here and just went uh, straight to 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, you can see the period number. Uh, if you're in period one, one shell, one shell. Period two, one, two shells, don't count the nucleus. One, two shells, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Period three, one, two, three shells, one, two, three shells, one, two, three shells, so on and so forth. Um, and then period four, four shells. Other spot patterns you might be able to spot, I mean, it's a bit difficult to see here, but as you go down the group, what tends to happen to the size of the atom when you go from top to bottom of the group? You're probably noticing that there's an increase in the uh, radius or the size of the atom because you have more shells, and there's a bit more to it than that, but you might notice some patterns like that as you draw some of these uh, Borough for diagrams. And so here you can see the trend of having all the same number of valence electrons. Uh, and as I said, you have three different classes of elements, the metals, metalloids, and non-metals. And these are what make elements metals, non-metals, and metalloids. They're divided based on these characteristics over here. So you can see the location differs. So for example, metals are on the left side of the periodic table. The legend color might change but metals are on the left side. When I say left side, I mean left of the metalloids, so relative to where the metalloids are. Um, and the non-metals are on the right side of the periodic table. Uh, and so the metalloids, we say they're kind of in between the two uh, classes there. Uh, and you can usually draw a little staircase out to remember where your metalloids are, so you can remember where your non-metals and metals are. There is an exception. Remember over here, hydrogen is not considered a uh, metal, but it's still on this side, the left side anyways, it's a non-metal though. Um, typically your um, your metals are going to be solid at room temperature. Uh, there are some exceptions like mercury, which is liquid at room temperature. Um, your non-metals, they can be uh, gases, they can be solid, they can be um, liquid at room temperature, but in general you're usually going to see that metals have a little bit of a higher melting point than the non-metals um, would have. Metals are typically um, lustrous, so they're shiny, whereas non-metals are, well, more dull, um, so they're not uh, so much, they're not really shiny. Metals are, are really good conductors of electricity, whereas non-metals are the opposite. They're poor conductors of electricity. So as you can see, metals and non-metals are really kind of opposite of each other. Metals are typically flexible, malleable, and ductile, whereas non-metals are the opposite of that. They're not really ductile. They're not really malleable. They're more brittle than anything else. Um, and uh, you can see other properties in which they differ. So for example, many metals um, uh, are will be silver in color, whereas it's not necessarily the case for non-metals. 
Uh, many metals will react with acids. Um, and like I said, they typically have higher melting points and boiling points than non-metals, which have lower melting points and boiling points. So it's important to know those differences um, between the metals and the non-metals and understand the metalloids are kind of somewhere in between. For example, they're not really good conductors, not really bad conductors, but they might, we might call them semiconductors because they're somewhere in between. Uh, and then you can further divide the metals and non-metals up into little groups or families. So if you're looking at the metals, you can divide them into alkali metals and alkaline earth metals. And there's also transition metals, but we focus on these two main groups over here, these two main families. So alkali metals, as you can see, they're group one. Alkaline earth, met alkaline earth metals are group two. Um, so one valence electron for the alkali metals, two valence electrons for the alkaline earth metals. Typically, um, the alkali metals are shiny, silvery in color. They're actually very soft. You can actually cut them with a knife. And they're actually very, very reactive with air and water because they only have one valence electron that they want to kind of donate. Um, and then uh, remember that I said alkali metals are in group one, but uh, hydrogen is not an alkali metal. It's a non-metal. Alkaline earth metals, they're the group two, so they have two valence electrons. They're still pretty reactive, um, uh, but not as reactive as the alkali metals. Um, they're also shiny and silvery in color, um, but they're not as soft as the alkali metal. So for example, calcium is pretty hard. You couldn't really cut that um, very easily with a knife like you could cut potassium, which is an alkali metal. Um, and a lot of these ones here, if you burn them in a flame, they'll burn with some bright colors, the alkali, um, alkaline earth metals will do that. Uh, and you can also further divide the non-metals into main uh, groups. Uh, so uh, if you took non-metals and you've classify them into separate groups, you could have one called the halogen group, which is in group 17, and one called the noble gas group, which is in group 18. So the halogens being group 17 means they have seven valence electrons, and you can see many examples here. And they're actually quite reactive. So most of these are reactive gases, um, except for bromine. Bromine is actually a liquid. Um, so uh, you have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, so on and so forth. So bromine is one of the kind of the exceptions, but they're all very, very reactive. Um, and then uh, many of them are, are also poisonous. So chlorine, for example, is poisonous, even in small amounts. Uh, but the fact is that they have seven valence electrons each, um, which makes them very reactive non-metals. Noble gases, on the other hand, um, they are in group 18. They have a full valence shell. Um, and uh, they're very stable as, as a result of that. They don't really react uh, very often. Uh, so some examples are uh, neon, argon, and krypton, and they're, they're colorless, odorless, and tasteless, and they're very unreactive. So that's what stable really means. And again, it's all because of that full valence shell. Uh, so this is just a summary of um, the periodic table. Uh, remember that uh, elements can form uh, ions. And when elements form ions, it really depends on what group they're in, what's going to happen to them. Typically, if you have um, three val up to three valence electrons, you're more likely to lose electrons um, to become stable. So if you're in group one, you'll lose one electron to become stable. Um, and so you'll become plus one because electrons are negative, And so you become positive when you lose electrons. Um, if you... Uh, lose two electrons, you become plus two. So if you're in group two, you lose two electrons, you become plus two. You skip the transition. If you're in group 13, you lose three electrons if you're a metal, um, and you become plus three. Uh, 14 behaves a little bit differently. So if you go to 15, you have five valence electrons. So you're more likely to gain three than lose five. So you become negative three. For group 16, you have six valence electrons. You're more likely to gain two to get to eight. So you become negative two. For uh, group 17, you have seven valence electrons, so you are more likely to lose one, uh, gain one electron than lose seven, so you become negative one. And then in group 18, well, you're already a full stable valence shell, so oops, a full stable valence shell, so you don't need to gain or lose, and so you likely won't form an ion. Remember that ions are charged atoms. Um, so these here rarely form ions because they're already stable. And here are some more uh, links that you can go to to learn more about the periodic table. Um, in the next video, I'm going to go and fill out the uh, the um, the note, the handout, fill in the blanks um, using this PowerPoint here. Uh, and I just want to show you one more thing: the periodic table that you have actually illustrates the uh, different states of states that the metals, non-metals, and metalloids are found at room temperature. So anything, for example, in the black font. 
represents a, a solid at room temperature. So as you can see, the metals, which are on the left side of the staircase here, are typically going to be solid at room temperature with the exception of something like mercury. Blue represents uh, a liquid at room temperature. Um, and then over here we have uh, bromine. Um, and bromine, uh, as you can see, the nonmetals, a lot of them are gases at room temperature. There are still some solids. Um, and if you look over here, though, bromine is a liquid at room temperature as opposed to being a gas like chlorine and fluorine. So I do need to make sure that I fix that in your uh, in your note over here. Um, so I'm going to put that um, our very reactive uh, elements here. Because bromine is still very reactive. It's just not a gas. So just fixing that in the note there to make sure that that's not completely um, inaccurate. As, as a gas, it would be reactive as well. So because I didn't state room, temp room temperature, um, that would have still technically been correct to say. So in the next video, we'll be filling out this together um, using the blanks. I recommend uh, using the PowerPoint, I recommend you try filling in the blanks yourself after you went through that PowerPoint video and just to see how much you remember from the, uh, from the lesson.